Welcome to the World Builders Anvil, episode 86. What is the cause of the end of your world? Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram once again, and I'm here with Michael Miller. And today we are going to talk about ways to destroy your world by going over ways that we know people have destroyed the world, and then you can come up with a better idea and let us know. And you don't even have to destroy your world. But, man, is it fun. It makes for great conversations and great stories. Like, there's so many great video games and movies and books that just that, the apocalypse. We just I'm going to overuse that word on this episode. Just really? Apocalypse, yeah. Or as we affectionately got into it on the the last one, we teased it with apocalypse. (laughs) Apocalypse. I don't think either one of us looked up the the actual plural. Oh, I I did, and it's apocalypse. It... (laughs) You're so full of it. Apocalypse, maybe. Well, where do you want to start? Okay, well, why don't we start from, essentially, when you think of an apocalypse, what comes to mind? Because I'm a very big about defining what words mean. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I think we have to agree on that. Like, if just someone just says the apocalypse, I think the, I'm, I was raised Catholic. I'm Lutheran now. So I think biblically the apocalypse that is uh, it's not the big thing that i think but it definitely comes to the forefront what probably comes to the forefront the most is like a disease so a post apocalyptic which is so contradictory in its terminology yeah. like everyone knows the post apocalyptic story mm-hmm. where something wipes out almost all of humanity and apocalypse in my opinion that means the world's over. The people are over. It's all done. So there is no people. So that post-apocalyptic, in my opinion, is a very contradictory turn. So I would think of biblical apocalypse and, like, say, uh, a big disease that wipes out, like, nine, more than 90% of mankind. That's okay. what comes to mind. All right. I, I think I'm, I'm pretty similar with that. Obviously, having the Judeo-Christian background, it's hard to miss that one in yeah, yeah, Sunday yeah. school. Yeah. Um, but, but like, um, of course, because of death of the dinosaurs, I also think of well, like an asteroid that always. Yeah, but I mean, too. I mean, that's a form of right water. Wait, no, that's Wonder Twins. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay, I yeah, Shana. <laughs> Maybe that show was leading up to the apocalypse. That's why they canceled it. I hear. Okay. Okay. But uh, now. You know, there's like four people listening that know the Wonder Twins. There's like four. <laughs> I, I counted them. <laughs> okay, everyone who's, who okay. knows the Wonder tw- Twins, yeah. put your hands down. Yeah, but we, we've counted you, but feel free to, to bother Jeff on his Twitter about it. So, all right. Sorry. So, how do you define, when you hear the word apocalypse, like what? For, first, tell answer the same question, what do you think of? And then let's agree upon, for the sake of the entirety of the show and mm-hmm. the discussion, what an apocalypse is. I typically think about, like you said, A is the end of the world in a biblical sense. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and then B, it is your post-apocalyptic mediums, your uh, uh, humanity either being wiped out or or nearly wiped out, and, and, and the story of the event, or usually the stories come right after the event. Okay. Sorry, I just remembered something and I want to add it. Uh, Jeff and I are actually working off of a list today, and uh, there's definitely something that I need to add to this list. Keep going. Yes, and so while he adds them to the list, I'm going to continue and start making up words about blowing stuff up. Like, um, of course, uh, pit boys are important. Every post-apocalypse must have a pit boy. Well, yeah, I mean, how are you going to get along in a post-apocalyptic world without one? It really just organizes your life. Yeah. And it'd be really great if you could actually travel by opening up a computer on your wrist and p- clicking on a town and then you and just fast, fast travel. travel. <laughs> yeah. That would save time. 
Oh, we're wait. Gonna, we're going to get on a lot. We're going to get on a lot of tangents. That's why we got to stay stick to the list. We got to stick to the All list. Right, let's get back to our definition, though. So, okay. so for the purposes of the show discussion, what are we agreeing to? What apocalypse means? Does, it, in my opinion, the word should mean the complete ending of life on the planet, which means mm-hmm. all of mankind is done. Mm-hmm. But I think for the purposes of fiction, that would be boring because there'd be yeah. no people to interact mm-hmm. with. So I think that we kind of have to agree on the post-apocalyptic yeah. definition where there is still a little bit of humanity yeah. left. Subsequently, there's a story to be told. Yeah, it's a story to be told of a struggle after a loss of basically what the world was. Or a struggle in an approach to an appending, an impending apocalypse. I think that's like fair, a, too. Like a known, like you know it's coming. Yeah. For whatever reason. That's fair enough. Okay. Reasons for the apocalypse. So a big show topic is the reasons for the apocalypse. Like how is the world going to end? And um, Jeff has geniusly written this fantastic list. Of, that you can't read? I can I can read most of them. Excellent. Of, um, I guess we would call those... Um, categories. Categories. Yeah, thank you. I would guess we... Or t- types of apocalypse. So we mm-hmm. have ecological. We have uh, impact slash disaster. Ugh. We have war. We have aliens. We have psychological, which that one's going to be fun. We have technology, supernatural, and disease. So we're going to start at the top of the list and go with ecological. So, okay. Well, the first piece of fiction we want to talk about here, and all of these uh, fictions we're going to be talking about will be in the show notes um, on Garduel.com. So if you go to the show notes for episode 85, you will find access to them all there. Uh, many of these are movies or video games, mainly movies. Yeah, mostly movies. Mostly movies. Just because that's the quickest and easiest way to get this conversation going. Yeah. And most people have seen movies. Right. And I don't read apocalyptic fiction I think or I, post-apocalyptic yeah, fiction. Yeah, I think I've only read one. Like, I was actually trying to think of that, too. And I, I, I can't think I can of, only think of like read. one or two books that and I've I read. Saw, I saw a list on it where they listed Foundation as... Oh, but I didn't I agree didn't with that. that. I didn't read it's, that. It's a classic Isaac Asimov science fiction, mm-hmm. and it's about the end of a intergalactic empire, mm-hmm. um, or the seeds of it, the foundation of it happening. But I, 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 I don't think that falls into our definition, and I, 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 I don't think it's a good. I could, we could. I'm going to get to it later. We'll keep going. <laughs> okay. So ecological. So uh, the the first one which we have both seen. Is Snowpiercers. Now, this is not what I would call a mainstream movie, would you no. call it? I mean, well, I would say that it's getting there because of the exposure it's getting now um, based on um, the main the main actor there, uh, Chris. Uh, he plays Captain America. I can't remember his name. Oh, that's Captain America. That's Captain America. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. I can't remember his his name. is. I'm drawing a blank on his name. It's Chris something. It's Captain other. America. Yeah. But and regardless, um, so on, it's on Netflix I think it's still on Netflix. So that's how I, I knew about this movie yeah. like probably about a year ago, but I didn't get to watch it until earlier this year because yeah. I didn't have access to it. I couldn't find it anywhere. Yeah, it's just one of those where I saw it on my list. I, I read the thing. I'm like, it's about the society. Mm-hmm. And just to give a, a brief synopsis of what, what, what the story is about. Let's let's. Is this the entire – we have to say spoiler for this entire episode. Well, I was going to say let's try to do our best to not – put any actual spoilers because a lot a lot of the examples we're going to use are some yeah, really great movies and yeah. if they haven't seen them I would prefer they be able to go see them without it being Yeah because in general us. the apocalypse has usually happened in most of these Yeah or it's pretty obvious by any material relating to the movie that what the apocalypse is yeah. is known so And we might have to do a spoiler I don't know I'm looking at the list quickly uh there is one other alien that there will be a spoiler for but it's been out for years, so that's your own fault. Yeah, that's um, yeah. But I think the rest of them. I think it's fair. It's fair. Okay. So, what causes the ecological disaster and apocalypse oh. in Snowpiercer? I, I know it, it was a global cooling, but I forget what caused the global cooling. I don't know if it was a dramatic sh- shift of the. Of the earth, do you remember exactly? What I don't caused remember it? exactly what caused it, but suffice for the understanding the movie and for the purpose of the conversation, yeah. it the world is in an ice age, yeah, like everything is frozen over, but they in a really bad ice age, like, yeah, like you will planet, die, it's planet wide, and yeah. they but someone was wise enough to figure out that you know it was coming and they planned so far ahead of it. Mm-hmm. 
that they created a train. Mm-hmm. A they they built a rail that literally goes all the way around the planet. Yeah, it it, it the, the entire circumference of the world. And I don't trained. know if it was even for the purpose of this coming. I think it just it what, took, was it. Or, I think no? no. I think it was you a business. It was, just, it was think a it business was just thing where transportation, and this just happens to be the super luxury train that takes you everywhere was around the was? world. I, I wasn't sure. Yeah. I, it seemed to. I, I, I maybe I'm making. They it covered it up. very briefly. So. Mm. Uh, uh, if someone rewatches it, uh, hit us up on Twitter and let us know. Yeah, I'm sure if we're wrong, you'll tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Internet. Thank you, Internet. So the ecological reasoning for Snowpiercer existing, and Snowpiercer is the name of the train, yeah. and for Snowpiercer existing is not terribly interesting. What is super interesting about that movie is it is a, a complete society, a high uh, – um, uh, you got, you know, the, the, oh, what is the word I'm brain farting on? Like the rich people, the high, yeah. high society. You've got yeah. the high society people. Then you have a, a, a small blue collar section. And then you've got a really large lower yeah. class. Essentially, it's also a good sort of, uh, you know, someone's interpretation of the class system. Yeah, a yeah. class, yeah. So you have a train. So effectively, you have a really long hallway. And, According to the movie, this is everybody left alive on the planet. Yes, you on, cannot survive out on one train. So, Wait. so how do you keep those? One, how do you keep those people alive? Mm-hmm. How do you balance out the, you know, the living quarters and the social structure, the food, like, and how do you keep getting it? Uh, that that's the an interesting thing in there too. Is you're in a closed system. Everything outside of your system is dead, except for oxygen in the air Mm -hmm. so you know food how does food keep appearing yeah and um i like i thought that they were going to go that's exactly what i thought they were going to do i thought that and actually that's a good one to mention right now too if anyone hasn't seen soylent green now the hands raising there i'll bet (laughs) maybe one soylent green is you've got to tell them you've got to tell them it's people so soylent green is a really great old school charlton heston science fiction movie from like the early Early 60s 70s 70s, i think it was 70s 70s okay um and it's super far future it's so slow paced but that's how they did them back then Mm. But it all culminates. I'm going to spoil the crap out of this movie. It's 50 years old. <laughs> and once again, it's a very famous. I think more people know they probably Soylent know. Green than know the movie. Right. Yeah. So you have a gigantic, again, a gigantic lower class. Mm-hmm. And there's like no food source. So what it comes down to is it, they are they are recycling dead people to be. Pleasant the, way of putting it. Right. To, to be the soylent green which is the food the base food yeah. staple that everybody eats to stay alive and it's just recycled i have to interject here Go right ahead. now there is a food company out there now that makes synthetic food called soylent green <laughs> i does may, it, does maybe it look like soylent green maybe it's just called soylent but the problem is you you can't use that name for a food company and have to eat it I will never try yeah. their food i, I don't think i could they trust make that. they make fake meat and it's it's supposed to <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We're calling it silent. It's fake meat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm going to skip that one. Yeah. But in Snowpiercer, that's not what they did. There was a different reason for how they come up with the protein. And mm-hmm. we won't spoil that because it's a very intense scene when you yes. find out what's going on. Um, the other big ecological, um, and I, I'm, and Jeff and I are going to talk about this because we're going to, I think we're going to fight briefly on this one, is Waterworld. Oh, my God. I mean, look, I know. That it is, it was one of the, I think it's on record as being the biggest box office flop ever made because yes. it, they spent so much money making it and so little and it return. Made so little money in return. I stand by that being no. a great movie for a number of reasons. <laughs> uh, I, I, you don't have to like it, but it, it accomplished certain things and created a very believable. If not no. stupidly implausible, because if basically how can wait how can it be believable yet implausible? See, that's because, the problem. Well, no, let's here. I'll explain. So when you walk into the, <laughs> I can't look at your face. You're making me laugh. <laughs> you can't walk into any movie theater about a movie you're about to watch, and you know it's very heavily fictionalized. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one thing if you go and you watch, you know, a historical fiction. Mm-hmm. You know that. While what you're watching didn't happen, it could have. It easily could have. You know what I mean? And something like 
Batman or, uh, you know, Waterworld or, or what have you, you know that that's not going to happen. You know that in Waterworld's case, it, it's it's physically it impossible. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not enough. Impossible. Not if, enough ice. If we melted all of the ice on the planet, it's twenty four meters. Yes, I think. Yes, yeah. only. I, thought, I want to say it's only like twenty four feet. It's really short. Yeah, but, but even twenty four meters is a right. Yeah, it's it only, would radically change the map. Yeah, but, but you would only lose yeah. that much shoreline. You wouldn't mm-hmm. lose a lot. And the story of the movie, if you haven't seen it or heard of it, depending on your age, is that the polar ice caps melt, and now there's literally no land left on the planet. We live on. A a fully water covered world. Oh wait, spoiler alert. What? That's not spoiler alert. That's That's true. That's not really it's not a spoiler. It's called Water World. <laughs> what am I spoiling? There's water all over. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I jumped the gun there. Anyway. Nice try. Nice movie. nice try to cut down Water World. Go ahead. Keep trying. <laughs> Keep trying. You will not convince me that it's a bad movie. Anyway. Um the thing that I like about it is that it makes me believe in its story. Like, it sells me. Well. And that, in my opinion, is successful fiction. If it, if it, if I can suspend my disbelief with very minimal effort and buy into the story, then that's successful. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of bad acting in that movie. Yeah. There's, the script there, is horrible. The script is horrible. Mm-hmm. I'm fine with this. But what I loved about that movie is how ever, all the set pieces, his ship and the other ships were very Mad Maxi. They very felt like everybody cobbled together all their stuff from whatever was left, whatever they could find in the old world, yeah. and that that was believable to me. That like that sold it to me. The, the, that the, the, that uh, part, I would agree. Are you conceding, Jeff? No. Are you conceding no. to me? All right, go ahead. That one part mind. is yes. That they they co- would have to cobble together that scenario stuff, and there's actually a little bit more of a reason to have the Mad Maxi look to the world. Let's go from here. Let's go right to war since we're on Mad Max. Okay. All right. But, um, Do you want to say anything else about Waterworld? Um, no, but I should spoil it so they feel no desire to go watch it because <laughs> the know? script, the acting is so bad. The ending is probably one of my least favorite endings of a movie ever. Besides it being utterly predictable. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. Um, just the, the, the way it's like they have to point out what the problem is to such a... Uh, uh, a low level of thing that most kid- kindergartners should have not been shocked with what you figure out at the end of the movie, which I won't spoil it for respect for you. And I guess disrespect to I, the audience it, because it, yeah, they might right. be tempted to go watch this piece of garbage now. Yeah. It's, I, I, look, it's not the best watch. I will absolutely concede that, but I like it. Um, but, like I said, my big reason for liking it is its feel like mm-hmm. Mad Max. So let's go right to let's go right to let's war. go right to war. And this is interesting because we're really talking about the series here because I haven't seen the new one. Oh, uh, it's I, it's so good. Okay, it's it's better. Mm, I've heard. I, a lot. I don't want to say that because the other ones are great for different reasons. Yeah, but it is an action spectacle. While it also has a decent story, like I cared, which two, I cared about yeah. the characters, mm-hmm. which I wasn't expecting to. Yeah, which two I thought was very good with with you know you you get pulled in with two with I mean it's essentially it's a long action scene most of two mm-hmm. not really most of two but a, a long part of two and I kind of got the feeling you're going to have a, something very similar to that at the end of this movie. Yeah, I mean the original Mad Max was slow. I mean it op- it was very slow. it opens very mm-hmm. very heavy. They've got all that action in the very beginning of the movie, but then there's a, a long slow period. And yeah. again, we're talking about an older film style. Mm-hmm. So and and people always argue about this, but it is Mad Max is the first movie. Mm-hmm. The Road Warrior is it's the true. second movie. And, and a lot of people get confused. They think Road Warrior is the first movie. They're thinking Mad Max. And I think most people that's where they started the series, right? Because I don't think the first one was particularly a huge movie. No, it was very small. It was a very yeah. small independent. Yeah, because I think it was it was made by some Australian company as well yeah, yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. So and uh, very brief because um, uh, I watched uh, the the makings of the documentary and all on. I love the Mad Max and all the stories behind mm-hmm. it. But how. Uh, that obviously is a movie that kicked off Mel Gibson's career. And, and how he got involved in it is he wasn't an actor. He was just like 21 years old. And he went with his friend who was an actor. And they were – he was – the guy, his friend, was just trying out for a part to be like a biker thug. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mel Gibson had gotten into a bar fight the day before. 
So he <laughs> was all busted up. Like he was, his face was swollen. He, he had a big black guy. He was all screwed up and whatever. And they were looking at him. They're like, you know what? You've got a good look to be one of the biker thugs. Why don't you let yourself heal and come back and we'll do a, a screen test. And when he came back and he had healed, they're like, whoa, this guy's actually a very good looking kid. Yeah. And they said, why don't you try out for Max? So, this, and, so he was really actually one of those, what people hope to be when they yeah, try and become an actor. Yeah, the yeah. actual magic story where, like, he was plucked out of wow. obscurity and that he became Mad Max. And then... So the, the lesson, history. the moral we're teaching our audience is to, if you want to make it in the world, is get to bar fights. And also be as pretty as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's how it started. Shoot, yeah. my career's over. Well, the irony is, though, he ended up being a fantastic actor. There's mm-hmm. plenty of very pretty people out there in the acting that are terrible. Yeah. So, um, but Mad Max, a war. What well, nuclear war occurs. And I have to say right here, Mad Max, in my humble opinion, is the most influential post-apocalyptic movie ever. I, I, I could agree with that. I mean, the look and feel... Of almost everything, especially if it's a nuclear-caused disaster, is so mad. Like you said, we talk about Waterworld. Oh, that's it's Mad, mad Max. Max. Yeah. yeah, it's Mad Max on water. It's almost, I think, a, a you know a, a way to describe something that most people know. Yeah, I think a lot of people will probably have a feel just like what you're saying for Mad Max if they've never been experienced any of those movies, but like if they've seen other such post-apocalyptic movies or video games or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then if they were to watch it, they'd be like, oh, this reminds me of this thing when they don't realize it's probably the other way around. Especially today, that's probably starting to happen with younger people. Yeah, Yeah. Mad Max laid the groundwork for it. Yeah, no, yeah, you got to wonder with that too is, and and, and the thing is, my question here, why we're on the topic of war destructions. Post-Cold War, do you think that has the influence today that it used to have? On the general, maybe people in in our age category, because we remember it. But I'm saying that, but younger than us now, is it starting to lose its impact? Yeah, I don't think people younger than us, like, I think if you're under, say, 30 or under 25, that really the idea of the Cold War is a foreign concept. Like, like and the fear of the nuclear war. Yeah, Yeah. the fear of nuclear war hanging over our heads. And take a look at every one of our. Our, our classic movies that were in that genre in the early mm-hmm. 80s and the, and the late 80s, you got, you know, uh, War Games. Um, what was that one where uh, uh, it was about the science project, but he makes... Oh, uh, Real Genius? No, no, no. But, well, no, because that's more comedy. Cause, and that was a little bit after, too. Yeah, yeah, it was a little bit. But it's another one, like, right around the time of War Games where they... Um, it might have been the man... I want to say the Manhattan Project, but I don't think that's right. Um, uh N- N- Nexus, Nemesis, Nebula. What the hell is there's another one that I'm thinking oh, of? Well, that's just, it begins that's, with an N. No, Millennial. Millennium? Millennial? That, that's millennium. the name of the new generation. I think Millennium is, is it's okay. another weird one. I, I'm not familiar with that one. It's, you're not missing a lot. I don't want a lot. But it's just like, <laughs> it's like, like that. Whole, well, that whole. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that, that whole era had so many movies that were Red Dawn mm-hmm. that were focused on the fear of. The Cold War turning into a, a third world war. A real world war yeah. as in a Red nuclear, Dawn. Yeah, nuclear. Or especially nuclear. Yeah. And I think the nuclear was starting to fade when we were kids. Yeah. There was yeah. less fear of that, but there was still this fear that you don't quite know. Yeah. I mean, I mean look, you know, all of the, the Gorbachev and, and Reagan talks, mm-hmm. you know, all of that started closing all that stuff down. Yeah. But, you know, the, the Iron Curtain, the Red Scare, you know. Yeah. I, I think that's stuff. maybe a story for another time. But Definitely. The, but I, I kind yeah. of wonder that, too. And I know that the genre is still popular. You know, like the Fallout's never been bigger. You know, there's just been a new Mad Max release. I'm not sure how well it did. It did very well. But you know what I'm saying? It's like well. the genre isn't dead. By, and I'm not trying to say that, but I don't think it's going to have quite the impact in the same way as Mad you know, watching Mad Max and go, oh, this is a nuclear, oh, the, this is what it could look like. Like, do you mean like when the original Mad Max landed? Like, well, when the second one came out. Because the first yeah. one was really before. Yeah, yeah. Or it one. seemed that way to me. Yeah. Uh, but, um, and, but And I would say, I, I would say that the impact that you're referring to probably hit harder with the third one. Yeah. I mean, the second one I still think was a little, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say fringe, but it still didn't have the blockbuster punch. Yeah, but the three third, was definitely a huge one. one. The yeah. third one was huge. So yeah, 
Um, t- t- tell me about Fallout. <laughs> I know that you've been dying for someone to say that to you. Yeah. F- oh, oh, yeah, Fallout. I just remember what that was. But mm-hmm. it is sort of, I would say right now, it's the quintessential post-apocalyptic see, uh, role-playing game, um, you know, for a long time. And it started with, I believe it was a claim, uh, made the original one, which was based off of this thing called Wasteland, which I had never played. Um, do you know what it was supposed to be? Do you know what Fallout Fallout was supposed to be? And the video game? The new Fallouts, I believe, have achieved it. The original Fallout on the computer was was supposed to be a GURPS system, oh, I know that. Yeah. Peter Jackson's mm-hmm. game. And he... The, I think there was a Fallout between... There was a Fallout. Yeah. There was a, literally, there yeah. was a little, literal Fallout between... The video game company and Peter Jackson, he eventually pulled out. Ironically, that's how I learned about the Fallout franchise was, I think, I, I saw, the, oh, there's this new GURPS video game. And yeah. that's when I, I had been playing GURPS and being a huge GURPS fan. I'm like, I was, wow. I'm such a huge GURPS fan. So if you're not familiar, GURPS is short for Generic Universal Role Playing System. It's not a game. It is a system with which you can create a game or play mm-hmm. any other role playing game. So yep. it's actually great. It's got some great world building tools yeah. built into it. There are some source books that can help you build better wor- worlds. And the thing is, it, it'll, it, the system is tight enough now in the newer editions that if you play by the rules, it's about as realistic as you want to get. Yeah. And, um, I liked that you could, it had a lot of, um, uh, you, you could slide the bar across, like you could either make the game so there was a lot of math and a lot of a lot of dice rolling mm-hmm. and a lot of a lot of really specific stuff. But I also liked that because I like the way we played better. Mm-hmm. We loosened all that structure, and it's much more story heavy and yeah. a lot less dice rolling. Well, I think that's just more my style as the game master. Is I, I well, not yeah. just you though? I mean, like the other guys that like Jim and my buddy John and Mike. We all use the GURP system. Well, I don't know them, but. I, I I think Jim learned a game master from me. You, did he? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, he started. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if he he might have done it some before, but it was after playing with me for a while was when he he really started getting the itch to do it. Say hi, hi to Jim. I don't know if he started listening yet, but I did pimp the show to him the other day. Excellent. I, I, I don't, so I don't know if he started listening, but um, Jim's such a good game master mm-hmm. i he got me to cry in a, in a in a game that we played all right no me not the character he got me to actually cry while playing the game because of the emotional journey he he, he brought me through and it was only me and him it was yeah. there were no other players involved in actually i i had phone calls with jim about that game really oh yes no uh jim would call me talk to me sometimes like if if, if it was just to help brainstorm stuff out for himself, but oh, it's not like a brilliant game. It, yeah. This is fascinating. We need to have a conversation about that because I would love to hear. That. I was sworn under oath I could never tell you. You can. We can't have a discussion Ever. about behind the curtain. What Ever. was the curtain really? Actually, I'll give you a secret. But okay, sh- we won't tell you. Okay. <laughs> so we're still talking about war causing an apocalypse, yeah. and we're still on Fallout. So obviously, yeah. it's in reference to it's a nuclear a, yeah. Fallout. It's a role playing game, and the thing I like about it, it's it's. It, the newer ones, I wouldn't call shooters. I think you can play them that way. Mm-hmm. People, I would say, probably if you're a hardcore shooter person, it's probably a pretty sloppy shooter. Um, three. Um, but it's close enough. But it's really, it's always meant to be a tactical thinking game. Mm-hmm. And uh, with role playing as the backdrop for it, which how, draws me in. How did the, the nuclear war occur? Like what? The nuclear war occurred essentially in a... And a resource race between China and the United States. That's not a surprise. Yeah, it, it's actually now it's actually more, much more plausible than even when when Fallout came out. People would have never thought, you know, yeah. China as the next superpower, even at that point, even though they were probably already approaching it. Uh, but but essentially, uh, the world's resources, you know, we we stopped figuring out new ways to drive energy, and so there starts to be this essentially arms race. In buying up the resources, and that leads to a conventional war, which takes place mainly in Alaska, where China invades and takes over Anchorage, and I don't know how much of Alaska, and the U.S. Uh, goes and to war. And I assume war. that's all just for oil. Uh, just for oil, because I believe it's the only place left in the world that had oil. Okay. For what I think that's it, it explicitly was, I think it was, for some reason... Either the the wells had all all gone dry, but that was the only source of oil left. 
And um, so China went to war with the U.S. with it. The U.S. then invades Canada. Because, of course. <laughs> it's in the way to drive your tanks up. Yeah, yeah. So you might as well just hit it on the way, I guess. <laughs> and and, um, and they go up. They liberate Alaska. The war is over for a couple of years. Everything is looking good. And which I kind of like, too, because people think it's this extension of the 1950s when you play the game. There's this huge 1950s kind of feel. Feel, yeah, yeah. yeah. It definitely has that. And the thing I like is it's actually <clears throat> clever because... The reason the fifties the fifties were so real straight laced in the U.S. was because people who were alive in the parents of that time had been through horrific lives. Mm -hmm. They were, were the Great, Great Depression, Depression, the two world wars. Yeah, it, it was not a pretty life, and they wanted they wanted their kids to have a better life. And this is sort of one of those scenarios where it. The pendulum swung way too far, maybe. Yeah, trying to create an idealized life. Exactly. And and so I think that's what was happening when the nuclear war was you're in this idealized, trying to make the world perfect for everyone who's left behind, everyone who survived the war, and then all of a sudden nukes. And I don't know who started the nuclear part. I I don't know if it's ever been released in the games yet. But um but, but, there was, they, but they saw it coming enough that in like in the 50s, everybody was building fallout shelters. Just in case, because there was definitely a Cold War going on. However, there's a lot of conspiracies from vault information that gets leaked that you can find in Fallout 3, which is actually one of the best parts of Fallout 3, is not the story of Fallout 3. The thing I like about Fallout 3 and the Bethesda games in general, they do a great job. Letting you just explore the world and you, you all the background information. You, you gain these little bits of background which enrich the world a lot. And most of the game hours I play are not involved in quest or stories. It's just digging through. The, I'm the on rubble. the way. Yeah, I'm on the way and like ooh shiny. Um, and 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 it's a great game for that. But in this one, you get this a lot of information. Uh, you find a lot of fallout, fallout shelters uh, uh, that were made that had for whatever reason, become defunct mm -hmm. and you learn why they were there. And and if you want to know and you didn't really get it playing the game, which would be very easy to miss, um, there's a, like a lot of YouTube videos that go through all of... All the fallout shelters. All the fallout the shelters and what was really going on there. Because huh. there's some question that they might not... They might have called people to the shelters even if there had not been a war. They might have what? Been planning to get the people into the shelters regardless of the war. Hmm. That's my personal theory at this point. Um, like a poc uh, like a poc a lot. You know that irregardless is not a word, right? Uh, regardless. Is, is it is it irregardless I? <laughs> That's the word. <laughs> well, actually, it would be a series of words smushed together. So It's old English. Mad Max, Fallout, Nuclear War. Yes. How much time do you want to spend on Mad Max? Because we still got a lot to cover here. We could do, we, or not Mad Max Fallout, rather. And I don't think. I mean, I, I I have an episode where I talk about the Earth of Fallout, and I don't know how much we need to go into Fallout here. But the idea is, this is a huge, this is a very typical kind of genre. I think right now, disease, ecological, and war are probably the three big ones. Yeah. Um. So, uh, but so I I think that's really enough here. And that's what we're talk more about. You know, are there non-nuclear potentially maybe some new technology in the future? Yeah. We could cruise through um, the the impact disaster one because that's yeah. going to be a footnote. So like deep impact, you know, the idea of an asteroid yeah. swinging on swinging at Earth or a super volcano exploding. One of the is, is it, they usually the ones that are produced now are disaster movies. I'm not a fan of at all of disaster movies. It's just not I'm, my taste. I'm I'm like back and forth because some of them were interesting enough to watch, like 2012, which was not a good movie. There were aspects of it that I enjoyed. Um, but you did like Waterworld. I did. I did like Waterworld. <laughs> I think I might have seen Waterworld in the theater. I'm pretty sure that I did. I wish I did too because I was hoping it was going to be a good movie. Yeah. yeah. Well, The Postman. You it's know. probably why I don't like it as much is because I actually you paid, paid for to it. See it. <laughs> so. Um, a movie like Deep Impact, a movie like Armageddon, which while the asteroid doesn't actually hit the planet, they're in preparation of it. So you've got all of this tension of like, look, we're all probably going to die. We have a Hail Mary plan that might work, but we're all prepping for, you know, the end of the world. Let me just throw in one here that we're not going to really talk about. 
but every other episode of it might be a lead up to one of these things. Sliders. Do you remember that show? Yeah, yeah. It's like every other episode, like you, they pop onto this new world. You have four hours and, oh, it's going to end in three. So and you have to figure out how to, you know. <laughs> I didn't realize in, they did that many. They, well, I don't know if they're really that many, but some of the better episodes were were that. And that was sort of a, a neat concept show, but there were some interesting ones where There's you would a lot of good see some, that show. Uh, where you could see some of the tensions that would be there as the. As the end is coming. Yeah. The the hopelessness of knowing that whatever you do is futile for mm-hmm. the next however long, whether you have a day or, you know, a month or yeah. what have you. Like, you know it's all going to be over. So, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Um, alien Attacks. Okay. Oh, this is actually... You, you, Stargate. Uh, yeah. This, you've got a big one for this. Let me, let me cover the little yes. one. And. I use the word little with air quotes because that movie is fantastic. But what, and what, as a intellectual property, this yeah. is one of the biggest this is one but, of the biggest ones of all. But also like, you know, just the influence that the original had it was War of the Worlds. Yeah. Um and also I read something that said that all of the hype that was created, like people actually believing mm-hmm. that when the radio broadcast went out was it was, real. was a lie. Yeah. No, I heard Oh was, really? I, yeah. I read this huge article that said that that was totally over exaggerated that that people were not. There were probably like panicked. a couple phone calls. Like, yeah, what's the, going on yeah. here? Like, I think that it was sensationalized in the in the media, propagated by the people that created. Well, I'm it. sure they probably helped encourage. Yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. yeah, as a as as like a media frenzy for the purpose of. Uh, I, I want to so believe. I want to believe. I'm going back to my old. I'm going back to my old world with that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So War of the Worlds, um, an alien invasion comes in and starts wiping out humankind like crazy the original war of the world movie i found to be very scary but i watched it when i was just the classic just a boy the yeah. classic yeah mm-hmm. and then i don't know if you remember the television series there was there was a television world. show in the 80s or late 80s i think I must... that maybe early 90s that oh i was probably I, overseas maybe <clears throat> but i really that was a great show and i thought that it was scary and again it was coming from the mind of a very young person mm-hmm. so like i look at some i've seen ha, since i have seen some clips from that show and, and it didn't like, it wasn't very scary like the first time i saw plan nine from outer space i was freaked out plan nine I'm, no. oh okay <laughs> <laughs> but it, I remember it being scary, like just the way the aliens would invade a person and the, and the, what the visuals that they mm. would show. It was it was frightening. Yeah. Um. And I really enjoyed with what they did in the new War of the Worlds. I don't think it was as good as the old one, yeah. but I thought that what they presented was still scary. You what, know, what the idea ups- of it? What upset me with the new one wasn't it wasn't a it wasn't a bad movie. Mm. But the thing was, you could see like all of the foundations that would need to be a great movie that they and did it didn't deliver on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought the stuff that uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because um, it's been so long since I've watched the original. It was Jim, Jimmy Stewart was in the original? I don't remember who was in it. I think so. And I could, I, 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 but it's that era. Definitely. Yeah. Again, yeah. the internet will will slap me in the face if I'm wrong because I might be totally misremembering. And if you're tweeting right now, I will slap him right now okay. for the internet. Um, but of course in the new one, it was Tom Cruise. Mm. Um, but I loved what Tim Robbins d- did in that movie. And he, he was when there's a, a part in the middle where Tom Cruise gets holed up in a house mm. and Tim Robbins is there and he's super paranoid, but he's like one of these guys who, you know, is stuck. Oh, like finally, survivalist. So, kind of, you kind of get that feel from him and he's like, oh yeah, I knew, I knew they were coming sort of thing, but mm-hmm. it, it's kind of like. No, you were crazy before they came. Yeah. You just accidentally were right on this. You, you've had your, you've had, you just had your yeah. insanity verified. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, but but the paranoia that he brings, like in the conversation, it's, mm. it's like, oh man, like you don't want to. It's a brilliant it's performance. Scary. Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent performance. Um, so you have some great stuff to share about Stargate, okay. which I have to apologize is not a show I ever watched. You should. I know. It's um, one that you and yeah. your wife love. Yeah, we've watched it way too many times. Aren't most um, of your cats named after Stargate characters? We have Ra, yeah. who, as you know, is a steel seeds and cheese, uh, who's named after the uh, main bad villain from the movie that the series spawned from. Right. And then we have Boo, who is not named after a cat, but we try to circle on her... Um, Anubis. <laughs> nice. Uh, yes. 
uh, because of the boo part there. But the problem was we got her. She was old, so we didn't really do that. Um, was her name boo when you got her? Yes. Okay. And essentially she was a street cat for a while. My mother-in-law took her in, and then we took her from our mother-in-law. Okay. So she wasn't listening to Anubis. Yeah. She wasn't It, it just didn't that. work. Gotcha. But, but her official name is Anubis. Gotcha. Um, just we don't use it. And then we have Ball. Do you know who that is? Uh, isn't it the B-A-H-L? Or B-A-A-L. B-A-A-L. Okay. But um, uh, do you know which cat that is? No. No. <laughs> you shouldn't because we never call him that. I was we call say, him Smoochie Pants. Oh, that's Smoochie Pants. Okay. Yeah, that's Smoochie Pants. See, I thought when you said when you brought up Ball, because I haven't heard that name in so long, I thought that maybe that was one of your cats that had passed. No. Okay. No, that is, and that was his original name, but the problem is, and you've seen him, he's a main coon cat, he has a very fluffy butt. Yeah, he's big. And a, a big tail. And so, and he's a, he gets in your face and he loves you and he wants to be a lap kitten, but he's just too big. And <laughs> But we call him Smoochie Pants. And then we had Thor, who was our cat who passed away, right. who was named after an Asgard character from the show, because he was gray in the Asgard. So gray. pretty much all of your cats have, were named after Stargate characters. Except for our new kitten, Boric, who you've never seen still. I was going to say, I don't think I've seen Boric. You've never seen him because as soon as you pulled in the driveway, he hopped out of the window and went down to the basement. He's a brave kitten. But Boric is actually named after the God of Chaos from my world. Awesome. Yeah. So... What is the apocalypse in Stargate? Okay, so it's actually one of those where they sort of use time travel to get around it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not going to get much into that part, but I found it interesting. The approach was they go through the Stargate and they find this world where the people are somewhat backwards. and uh, But they seem to be doing well. They're like, very healthy. Uh, there's not a lot of people there, but... So this, so just to explain if, to someone who has no idea what Stargate is, they have Stargates. They have a gate mm -hmm. that they, they already exist on all these worlds, yes. and people basically unlock them as a means of effectively teleporting from one planet to another planet. Yeah, the argument being that they were created so long ago, the race that created them have long since left our level of existence. Okay, and um, and then with the red shifting. Essentially, you dial in a coordinate into the computer, and it dials a path to this thing, and then you set through a wormhole once the, the two Have portals connected. connected. Yeah. And, and they weren't working. Uh, the, the theory once of the, the show was the dial-up tones, tones out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like you shift off so you don't quite line up. And then once they figure out a few, they actually start reconstructing the red shifting of all of the planets to uh, – open up the network again. And then they find out there's other worlds that are on the network or aren't on the maps that they got from the, the villains early on in the show. And so it starts to open up a, a larger and larger universe. Okay. And, um, and the interesting thing was they go so, through, so, so they go to this world mm -hmm. where things are backwards. Yeah. And, and along the way they, they um, meet, meet an alien race who's now come and helping the people. And they're like, Oh wow. And, and, and they're sitting there, and they, they've met several alien races that are sometimes powerful enough to not only help them, but, you know, end this great threat on Earth, which is the Gua'u. And so they find this race there, and as always, uh, uh, they go up and they're like, well, it'd be nice if you give us weapons. And they're like, or, you know, do whatever it takes to help us stop, you know, the bad guys. And they're like, okay, if we can come up with a treaty, we'll do that for you. And they're like... Because all of the other races that they found super powerful are like, no. Yeah, they don't want to help. It's like one are pacifist. Another one is like, well, we've helped someone before and they destroyed themselves so we don't do that again. There's always a reason they can't really help. Mm -hmm. And these guys are like, yeah, we can help you. We just want to have a treaty so it's all mapped out. They were very organized people. I'm like, wow. So talks ensue and then all of a sudden they come through and they sign this agreement. And they start ending hunger ending disease. All of this wonderful stuff. You know, it's the anti-apocalypse. It's great. Until they realize at the end of when it's way too late that they've actually embedded into humans um, a deformity that will not allow them to bear children. So everyone that's alive is the only one. Will be the last, be the last generation of humans. Yeah. And this other planet, they kind of, is kind of where they help figure it out is they go there and all of a sudden, you know, they realize that 
this guy said, has something. He's like, I have an iron root problem. And they're like, what's that? They're like, that's an iron root. It's over here. And they show him it's this big, like, steel reinforced uh, pillar from a, not pillar, but a beam from a skyscraper that's jutted out of the earth in the middle of his field. And the people there are not technologically advanced enough that to have a to have this. Yeah. And they go down and they start finding all these news articles of this new race that shows up. And, oh, wow, poverty's gone. These guys are wonderful. Then, wait, wait a second, what's going on here? And essentially, really, what they had found was like this end of a species by this race because they're really there for the resources, but they're patient and th- they'll let you kill yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll they'll just... They'll tweak you a little bit when they help you. They help solve your illness issues so you never get sick again, but you'll never have children again. And mm-hmm. you will ultimately die. And, and they, they can, have your world they and they can harvest it. Your planet yeah. Or strip, it, was, it, was strip a, mine your it was just a clever approach to it because it was the alien invasion, but it was just done in a way that was backwards where you're, you know, and you could obviously tell you're watching a, a, a movie or reading a book that. They're not meant to have happy endings. They're meant, you know, because how boring would that story be? Yeah. And the end, everything's happy. At Ta-da! Prosperity! And everybody's good. No, no, no. That's, that doesn't make for good fiction. Or my favorite one, because we talked about Independence Day, which is obviously not, you can tell from my opinion, which is a fine movie. It's a good watch. It's a worthwhile watch movie. Oh, okay. Independence Day. Okay. You need to stop right there. That's your water world. Oh, you hate it. I don't hate it. But everything you're saying about it is not true. It's not fun watch? Eh. It's not a fun watch. I'll give you it's fun, but it's not good. I didn't say it was good. Did you I? did. What did you just say? Well, I said it was fun. All right. Keep going. Okay. It's ba- it, The beginning of that movie is based off of Arthur C. Clarke, who's a, one of the most brilliant science fiction writers of all time. Childhood's End. And the idea is all of these gigantic spaceships start come hovering down. And they're there to fix the world. But no one on that world can accept it. No one can accept it. And I don't want to end it, but the difference was after all of the giant saucer ships come down and park over the cities, the stories diverge 100% Mm -hmm. because they're not there with spaceships to take over and destroy the world. They're claiming to want to help people. They're like, apartheid will end tomorrow. And South Africa's like, no. And they create a disc that blots the sun out from their fields. The aliens create a disc that blocks Yes. Them? Okay. And the next, you know, day or a couple of days later, they're like, okay, apartheid is over. <laughs> and the disc goes away. And, you know, that's the most force that they use. You know, there's an example, too, where I think it's, I forget if it was France and Germany, but it was something like that where, you know, there's a spaceship over two European capitals. And so one fires nukes at the one at the other person's capital, <laughs> you know, to try and let's see if we can blow up the ship by fire nukes at it, but we'll shoot it over the capital of Paris mm-hmm. from Germany. Mm-hmm. You know, it was something like that. And, but, it, but it was neat because they're there really trying to, 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 to stop everything because like humans have great potential, but until they get past the violence and the poverty, they'll never be able to, to evolve. And, but no, none of the humans believe them. Because, oh, no. No, no. What what do you know? Yeah. But it's (laughs) actually, it's a great book. And I hope they don't make a movie out of it because it's one of those where, it's one one of those I don't know if they can do right. Yeah. You know, the story's a little too deep. Maybe a miniseries, but I don't think they could really do it justice in a a movie. But, um, but back to, back to psychological. Well, before we, I, I got one quick footnote while we're on Alien. Um, so Alien Apocalypse. But the other side of it, um, Ender's Game. Ender's Game is really familiar. I don't think I've seen it, though. Go ahead. Oh. I might have. You could see it, but I encourage you to read the book. Okay. Uh, Ender's Game is a series. There's, I, I, I honestly don't even know how many books are in it at this point. Like, the father wrote a whole bunch, and then the son wrote a few books. But I haven't read all of them, and I started reading the second book in the series, and I honestly couldn't get into it. I think it's the third or maybe the fourth book. I recommend reading Ender's Game and then Ender's Shadow. And Ender's Shadow is most of the same events that occur in Ender's Game, but told through the eyes of a different character. Oh, that's interesting. It's a brilliant approach. Like, Ender... Ender's Ender's Game is about Andrew Wigan. It's about... And his nickname is Ender. Mm -hmm. And Ender's Shadow is... 
basically the things that happen in Ender's game told through the eyes of Bean, which is his f- f- like first advisor. And uh, it's just absolutely great. But the, the apocalypse that occurs in that is man committing genocide against another alien race. Oh, so, oh, that's interesting. So it's okay. man creating an apocalypse, okay. which is really, really Fair interesting. Enough. And, and, and how, just how they build the story and, and how it goes, how they go about it. Like, it's such, it's such a great story. It's, it's one of the few books that I've read more than once. Excellent. There's oh. very few books I've read more than once, but that is one of them. Okay. Um, or two of them, rather, because we've got Ender's Game and Ender's Shadow. Yeah. So anyway, uh, moving on. So far, we have covered ecological, um, impacted disaster, war, and alien, uh, kind of generically alien because we the alien alien invasion. Yeah. But but of course, if we all understand well, the concept of an alien invasion coming in and wiping well, out most. Well, technically, of the they both were. It was just a different style of invasion. Um, actually, uh, another another good one, another footnote one good for that one is um. Oh, I wrote it down here. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, maybe no, it wasn't hell. Um, it was basically like these aliens that had come that were they're invisible and they're sucking energy. Like, okay. And but they can totally wipe a person out just by touching them. And so they 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 kill most of the the human race until we finally figured out a way to one see them and mm. two fight them. And then the rest of the story is about humanity trying to destroy these aliens. Oh, if I get killed by losing all my energy, I would not want it to be that way. What do you mean? Um, by just getting immediately... I mean, they like break you down. It, what, it looks I, like you get broken uh, down at a molecular oh, level. Oh, okay. So this isn't really taking... like This is like a energy being sucked out. They're like converting you into something. Yeah, like they just annihilate a person in like half a second. It's like... Gone. Delicious. Yeah. Okay. But they also... What's neat is like how they realize it is... There is a small burst of energy Mm -hmm. and then the loss of energy. So like these aliens, which again, until they figure out a way to see them, they're invisible. And what they figure out is there's a small, they, they radiate a bit of energy. Mm -hmm. So they, they get like handfuls of small light bulbs Mm -hmm. and they like throw them on the ground and, when one of these aliens comes near, they start to light up yeah. and they realize, Oh, okay. Somewhere in that vicinity, you know, it's, it's pretty. Uh, and I'm going to throw another one quick one out there about that. Have you seen defiant? It's a series. I, I think I've seen maybe an episode of it. It's one of those ones that was on the peripheral of my, like yeah. I wanted to get into it, but I didn't have access to it. I think it might be Amazon prime. Yeah. Um, um, the free version uh, of it. I don't know if it's in the other ones or not. And it's only the first season they have right now, which is frustrating because I watched it and it was, it was very good because it was for like alien invasion is starting and I don't know if they get into it and I wouldn't want to spoil it if they did. But essentially as the humans are being genocided by this alien invader, um, they do something to break down the com- the command structure of the aliens. And so now you have this, it feels yes. like a nuclear apocalyptic world. So you have a splintered force. Uh, forces. So you, you start, and so now you're having these cultures that are forming up with humans, and some have aliens, and it's it's interesting the way they they dealt with it. So it's now it's only three or four seasons at this point. It might be. I've only yeah, seen I mean, one. is it still going, or did it? Cancel? I don't know because no. I can't see season two, gotcha. which is frustrating. All right. So our next one. Do you want to skip? Psychological and come back to it. I was going to use it as a bonus one, but you kind of ruined that when you spit out. The Sorry. Game. So let's just go ahead. Well, you said it. psychological before. You you said it. Well, yeah, but you listed it at the very beginning. That's the reason. Why. Oh, I didn't realize that's what you meant by that footnote there. Yeah. Well, we can still skip and make it a bonus one. Go well, to te- at the go end to- because I think that's interesting. All right, go to technology. Uh, technology. Unless you want one of the other ones first. No, no, we'll just go into one. Technology, uh, Terminator, and we kind of argued about about this one because they don't ever. Really sure, at least not in any of the actual main intellectual property. There, there's maybe a comic or something out there about it. But what do you mean, the actual apocalypse? Or yeah, or how, how it went down? Well, they talk about it. They do sort of have some of it. And if you watch, um, I mean, have you seen every single one of them? Did you see the one with Christian Bale? Because the one with Christian Bale, they're in a post-apocalyptic war with the machines. Is that the latest one? No, the newest one is the one in. It's in. You're right. No, I, I, ha- I have seen the one with Christian Bale. Yeah, which I there were aspects. It was okay. Yeah, there were aspects yeah. aspects about it that I really liked, but there were some details that I thought were so friggin' dumb. But I'm really thinking more of the original trilogy, yeah. which was. We, Let's not call it a trilogy because the third one was so terrible. Yeah, but it, it was it, it was a capstone to the story. Fair enough. Yeah. 
Oh, actually, yeah, because it because of how it ends. It's Judgment Night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess technically <laughs> they do get to it because yeah. they get to the tools that are used, but it's really we call, we call it technology because it's the technology taking over. It's the Cylons taking over the humans. Oh my gosh! Why didn't we didn't in the pre-show did not break down? We this. didn't even think about the Cylons, and that's which and I that, just thought about this now because I say best ones and with nukes and blah. yeah. Oh yeah. my god! Talk about perfect technology destroying mankind mm-hmm. is, is Battlestar Galactica. Mm-hmm. Wham! What a great story! And I. I'm fond of both versions of that. Oh, um, I love that. The newer, newer one I liked better stylistically. Well, I think the um, newer one had a lot more to offer. They had more time to flesh out and, the story. And, and they, had, they had more more time to make episodes mm-hmm. too, which the original and one certainly was certainly more money. Well, no, but see, you don't think? Here's the problem. You know, it's like now when you have these small eight or nine episode series, they have the same budget as like maybe a, a full series, mm-hmm. but they do so few, you, you get a lot more impact with the dollars per yeah, episode. But weren't, weren't, wasn't um, Battlestar, weren't they like 20 episodes? No. Uh, no, they were like no. less than 16 episodes. Is that, the first season was the longest season. Then after that, they started doing the, 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 the .5 yeah, seasons, the seasons, which were really not true. They were really seasons, you know. But they were just so small that I think they called them half seasons yeah. at the point. And now you're seeing shows that are just five ten, or six. Ten, twelve yeah. episodes. Well, well, you get good impact. To, to be fair, there's a lot of shows out there that we have access to now that are coming from overseas. And the yeah. BBC... Has always done that. The BBC yeah. makes their shows are they create a complete story and that's it. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of shows from the BBC that are literally six or twelve episodes and that's it. The story's or shorter. Done. Yeah. And the story's done. Mm-hmm. They don't they don't renew the show because they've told the story it was set to do. Yeah. Whereas in the United States We uh, can't let it go. Well, not only do we we can't let it go, but they create a show concept without a full story. So mm-hmm. they are actually creating the story while they go. Yeah. So that's so they have why, an arc, but not the full story. Right. Yeah. So like they'll, and then if the show gets picked up for season two, they're writing it as they go. Mm-hmm. So when it's done that way, you don't have as as a high of a chance of the show coming out to be as good as some of these clean cut, closed. That's one of my problems. And sometimes yeah. even though it's like when you get the full story arc, like Lost, you're like, yay, full story arc. Wait, why are we having another season? It, yeah, exactly. <sighs> Because it made a lot of money and the advertisers are paying, yeah. so let's let's write another season. I I think that's cowardice, but <clears throat> that's the artist in me, I guess. Yeah, not yeah. The- like it created a full story, and what I think is one of the perfect models out there right now is American Horror Story. Mm-hmm. They made a complete story with the first season. It did amazing. The second season has nothing to do with the first season. It's a mm-hmm. completely different story, but almost all of the actors from the first season are yeah. in the second season. So they, so the actors get the joy of playing a completely different character than they played in the prior season. Mm-hmm. They get to express themselves and stress, yeah. stretch as an artist. And it's a totally new self-contained story. Yeah. And that's what they have done. They're up to season four or maybe they're creating season five now. And that's a cool idea. It's like, a great idea. You, you know, it's like some of my favorite properties of all time have been stories that have been planned. Uh, Cowboy Bebop. Oh, I love that um, Cowboy Bebop. I mean, probably my one of the few animes I really love. Um, one of my favorite science fiction of all mm-hmm. time. And it was a 26-episode story. They told their story. Every episode was delicious. Yeah. And, Great show. Um, just a brilliant – but when the story was done, they let it go. Mm. Yeah, and, and the movie takes place, I think, between the last – it takes place between yeah. one of the last few episodes. Yeah, it was so it does right as they were getting ready to break down. Right, so yeah. it doesn't interrupt. It doesn't. It doesn't contradict the show. And the way the show works, there's there's time between episodes, and and that's the the way they could have really monetized it, which wouldn't have hurt it. Would they could they could have done several movies between, between episodes because yeah. most of them weren't back to back story, which is the great thing in a space thing is. If it takes you a while to travel somewhere, you don't need to show the travel time. Right. Um, so, all that stemmed from starting with Terminator and talking <laughs> about machines destroying or technology yes. destroying mankind. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the Matrix universe. But I, I don't think we need to talk about the Matrix itself so much as I think it's important to mention the Animatrix, which okay. I know you haven't watched. I've not watched. But... If 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 you haven't, and by you I mean the listener, if you haven't watched the Animatrix, and if you enjoyed the Matrix even a little bit, I highly recommend it because mm-hmm. in the, the Animatrix is a series of nine animations, and they're all their own thing. 
They're not related to each other, so it's not a series. They're all different. Like, each story is its own thing. Each story is its own animation style, mm-hmm. too. They're all done by different people. And um, in there, there is one that catalogs the history of how the war between man and machine in the Matrix universe mm-hmm. came about. Yeah. And it is really interesting. Yeah. The in, in a nutshell, and I don't think I'm spoiling by sharing this because um, it's not as interesting as what's told in... Uh, I'm going to share more of the context than mm-hmm. than the concept. Uh, the basic gist is, you know, we create uh, sentient machines. They start off as our labor force, and it kind of eliminates our working class. But th- it's done in a fashion where everybody gets to live better because mm-hmm. now all of our 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 everyone gets our, the fruits of the labor. Everyone gets the fruits of the mm-hmm. labor exactly. But because we do create artificial intelligence, they are sentient, and they get to the point where they're like, okay, well, we are seceding. And we're going to create our own country. Now, imagine a country of individuals where they all get that they are part of a bigger thing Mm -hmm. and they don't mind contributing to that bigger thing. Their economy, like virtually overnight, becomes the most stable economy on the planet. Well, that and and no one else knows how to do anything anymore. Well, and, and they're so efficient because they're machines. They're constantly coming up with ways to do things more efficiently. So they basically like end up wiping out the world economy because their individual economy is so much better than any other economy on the planet. Mm-hmm. Well, of course that pisses off humankind and we start a war with them. I mean, think about, <laughs> I, I think a good thing to think about here is we don't do so good with each other. Yeah. You take these things that aren't human and, um, wow. You, you, you know, the humans won't like something that's not a human. Yeah. Um, maybe over time, maybe they look similar, but you know, it's- there, there's um, a funny concept, and I'm surprised I didn't touch on this in the prior episode because we talked about uh, Shadowrun and the cultures mm-hmm. within Shadowrun. Um, but what happens is racism takes on a new face in that world because first it's like, oh well, I'm I'm black and you're white, I I hate you, mm-hmm. or, or I'm white and you're Mexican, I hate you. Yeah. Well, in the Shadowrun world, people start having goblins, elves, dwarves. You know, orcs, ogres, these mm-hmm. all, these uh, races all start b- being born to human parents yeah. and then subsequently having their own children. So you start having all these different races and now everyone's like, well, okay, I'm human and that thing over there is nine feet tall. I hate that now. Yeah. So, like, I don't care that you're a different color than mm-hmm. me, you, but you're human at least. And I forget who I heard this from, but it was... Some person in the celebrity slash thinking world, I don't know. Someone who I would have heard and not enough to remember them. But the thing is, if you want to end racism, have aliens invade. Well, I mean, that's – that's uh, yeah. uh, spit, spit it out because I can't. Um, the comic book. Uh, they just have had the movie aliens. a few years. Yes. Um, oh, th- that's the whole geez, point. That's the whole point of the movie. Um, no, 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 no. The big – it's like the best comic book ever made. Um how can you not be helping me on this one? You really don't know what I'm talking about. Um, because the, com- say the, ba- the comedian, the big blue guy. Um, oh, the tech. No. Now I know you're screwing with me. You know what I'm talking about now. Mr. Manhattan, uh, Rorschach, the comedian. I'm going to punch you. Alan Moore. Thank you. I have no idea what you're talking about. Would you please say the name of it? Because it's Watchmen. Insane. Thank you, Watchmen. <laughs> That's the whole point of Watchmen is to unify the world in a hate for something else. Yeah. To unify mankind and 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 create a mindset of it's us, all of us versus something else. But it's like we need that versus something mm-hmm. else, or we can't unify ourselves because we just have to be first something. So we'll be versus some others of ourselves. Another great story about that in a comedy form was Canadian Bacon. Where essentially, have you seen that one? I don't think so. I didn't realize it was anything like that. It's a post Cold War movie, and the John, idea, John Candy, right? John Candy's in it. Alan Alda is the president, and he's really mad because all of his predecessors can blame all of the problems on Russia. Who does he have? He starts a Cold War with Canada <laughs> to try and create that enemy, that threat that you know America could unify and he could you know have reasons that he kept failing at stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, and it's true, you know, when you have an enemy and, and this happens all the time because I mean, think about even in politics today, instead of it being the Soviets, it's now that party, you know, it's now Mm -hmm. the Democrats or, or, oh no, it's the Republicans, you know, somebody across the aisle, the game, but you know, it's like when you want to consolidate political power, you need someone to blame because guess what? You're human too. 
no matter what your intentions are, no matter what your plan is, it's flawed. Hmm. Maybe I'm just a pessimist. Hmm. Maybe. Um, but there's a lot of great movies out there that get into the, the dangers of creating artificial intelligence. Yeah. Creating, or rather, well, actually, yeah, I was going to say self-contained artificial intelligence, i.e. it's just on a computer. Yeah. Or mobile artificial intelligence, i.e. they have bodies. So like mm-hmm. Terminator or the or the Matrix. Or, or you were talking Chappie earlier. Chappie. Uh, Chappie's brilliant, but that's not – like Chappie doesn't get into – That's not the story of it. No, oh. no, no, no. It's, it's, Chappie is a lot more social. And it's, or the it's, quintessential – It's not apocalyptic. The quintessential Philip K. Dick book, which you, you have to kind of bring <clears> up because it was leading up towards the apocalypse of the world. Do Android Dream of Electric Sheep. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, A.K.A. Blade Runner for the movie watch. Well, I was going to bring that one up, yeah. But, I mean, that, that that was the name, was Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which is so perfect. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Blade Runner. And if you like Blade Runner, and that's a quick side note, watch Chappie, watch uh, Automata, and watch uh, Ex Machina. All very good movies, like like especially Chappie and Ex Machina. I just watched those in the past, like two. I know Ex Machina is in my queue, oh, and it's, it's one of those so where it looks good. interesting, but no, I wasn't sure. It's, so it's super watch good. It. Like okay. it is super good. Okay. So, what did you want to cover about Blade Runner and Android's Dream of Electric Sheep? Essentially, what I was trying to, what I was trying to get to there was it's this idea of of the growing sentience and what does it mean, and it. It does make sense because the world's ending, but I think more of an ecological disaster. But the 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 importance of at one point does something become real, and especially when you get to the book, it's really a mind screw where you don't know. The character loses track. He's not sure who he is. Wait, is this police station all police or are they androids? I you you and if if you're familiar at all with Philip K. Dick, that's his work. It yeah. screws with your mind in a beautiful way. But, you know, it's this idea of when does it become life? And then mm-hmm. from there, and all, you know. And all of the movies I just mentioned, mm-hmm. that's what they explore. Yeah. When does it become life? And 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 sometimes they go the route, the Terminator and Animatrix. And there's always been this fear, you know, Luddites, you know, from long, long ago of technology supplanting and destroying humanity. Well, look at iRobot. There's a classic yeah. Isaac Asimov yep. where, you know, we've created – you know, artificial intelligence, we've created sentient robots, and they've decided that they're the next stage of ed- evolution. It's time to yep. let humanity go mm-hmm. and move forward. Which is why you end up with, you know, the, was it, the three rules of robots? The, the yeah. three laws of robotics. Thank you, the three laws. Which, I was, it's funny you should mention that, because I was, it's because of that watching Ex Machina the other day, I just reread them, and I'm not going to get them word for word, so please don't anyone write the show Prepare and yell, to yell at me. Internet. Exactly. But it's basically um, the first law of robotics is that a robot cannot harm a person by action or inaction. Mm-hmm. Um, the second law of robotics is a robot has to obey the uh, commands of a human unless that command disobeys the first law. Yeah. And the third law is a robot must maintain and protect its own existence unless doing so disregards either rule one or rule yeah. two. So which is basically so, the way I remember. Yeah. yeah. So if you create an AI, you kind of without with if, if you if you make them adhere to the three laws of robotics, which is certainly a safeguard to keep humanity in control mm-hmm. and safe and alive, then you you don't have a complete artificial intelligence because you've governed it. Mm-hmm. But if you create the AI without that, then you create a very large potential danger because not necessarily because it's going to be dangerous off the rip, mm-hmm. but because humanity is not going to welcome it. Yeah. Uh, eventually somebody, and in every one of these movies, mm-hmm. you see how man sees artificial intelligence as a threat and subsequently yeah. artificial intelligence then sees mankind as a threat. Yeah. And that creates the conflict that leads to an apocalypse. And think about it, Just look at the world right now. You have people like Steve Wozniak, a legend in the computer mm-hmm. world, you know, out there talking about the dangers of AI. Yeah, and 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 the singularity. And and the irony being, we don't really know. You, you know what I'm saying? What will happen? Um, you got to watch Ex-, Ex Machina, and and we have to have a conversation about it. Yeah, it's okay. so good. We'll do it's that. So maybe smart. we'll do a world review on that. Oh, it doesn't have to be on the show. I'm no, no, I mean we maybe we will. Yeah. yeah, 
But so uh, reviewing every world, we should probably get back. Yeah, to keep, we'll keep moving. So, uh, so that's technology. Te- te- pretty simple. You hear the word technology coupled with, with, with the word apocalypse, and all of us can come up with a decent story that we're mm-hmm. aware of within that. And Terminator and Matrix are, are were our chosen go tos to explain that. Supernatural. I don't think we need to be really i don't think we need to spend too, too much time on this one there are 10,000 shows that do the lead up the final days yeah. kind of stuff and i'm not going to mention any of them um i picked a real oddball <laughs> one for this and yes. I, like this one really i dug deep for this one but cuz again there's probably only one other person in the audience that saw this movie but rain, you saw this movie i've seen this i saw, i was excited about this movie i saw this movie in the theater too and i, I did not i i absolutely did and it, w- and it was a letdown, mm-hmm. but the world was, again, like Mad Max and like Waterworld, it was uh, engrossing. Like mm-hmm. it pulled me in. Yeah. So Reign of Fire, which was a Christian Bale, Matthew McConaughey um, uh, engine, uh, <laughs> that we'll call it. Yeah. Um, it. It was not a fantastic movie, but the, the, the story is that dragons yes. are real. Mm. That they were maybe a, lay- a layover from the dinosaur age, and they 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 wake back up. Dragons wake back up, and they are so powerful mm. that they virtually wipe out all of mankind. We've got crazy weapons of war, but they're not enough to take the dragons down. And that's what the nom, whole story nom, is. Nom. Yeah, the whole story, like the whole thing, is like how do you live in a world where it is so dangerous? to be even on the surface, mm-hmm. like let alone driving around or, or in the, forget about being in the air because they yeah. own the sky, mm-hmm. you know, and they just start multiplying and then they slowly, it just becomes the most dangerous environment that the world has ever seen because you can't even, you can barely be on the surface because if a dragon happens to come around, it's going to wipe out your whole colony. And I, I would agree. I think this is an interesting story and a fun watch. Yeah, it is a fun watch. Yeah. It is a fun watch. The ending is disappointing. Like yeah. I thought it had a lot more potential than how they go about it. But, and you know what? I will say some solid performances. If, if wasted on this movie, <laughs> I think Christian Bale and Matthew and McConaughey, McConaughey are both, Tremendous yeah, actors, yeah. yeah. But even in those that particular movie and their, their particular roles, I thought that they were they actually they nailed were, it. They yeah. were compelling. They were very compelling. Because there are there are those times where you watch like the great actor in a bad movie, yeah, and they're maybe not quite as bad as everyone else, but yeah. still, this they can't recover the script. Yeah, yeah. And there's other other times where it's like you have that incredible actor and. It, like with with this case, you've got two incredible actors, mm. and they play off of each other really well in that movie. And it's like, and Matthew McConaughey's character is just just nuts and so passionate and scary. Mm. And you're like, wow, because at that point he hadn't played anything like that, where like you hadn't seen that from him. Not not in a convincing way, anyway. I mean, I know he was in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Next Generation, but Whatever. it was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and Christian Bale always solid performances yeah. from him. So, um, really, what's that? Really, <laughs> really. Yes, I'm a big fan of Christian Bale. <laughs> no matter how his voice sounds, sounds awesome. Swear to me. <laughs> I um, swear it sounds awesome. I swear all the it time. sounds awesome. Uh, so, disease. Are we ready to talk about? So, well, before we close down Supernatural, I think that um, if you're gonna take on supernatural as a reason for your apocalypse that one it should make sense in your world i think that that's a given um like the the weird thing about rain of fire is that it's it's a completely regular world and then all of a sudden a you know fantastical you know magic i mean they don't they never say they're magic i actually just say it's biology which is fine i actually like the way they present it in the movie but it's it's a fantasy creature dragons are fantasy yeah. So to have that introduced in, in a very believable way in yeah. that movie is great, but I don't recommend doing it that way. No. Like if you have, if you're going to take on Supernatural, I think that it should fit into your world mm-hmm. like a puzzle piece. It shouldn't, yeah. it shouldn't come out of nowhere. And it's easy like on Earth. I mean, just think of like there are tons of movies, The Seventh Sign. The, the Omen movies were technically. The Seventh the, Sign. Wow. Yeah, that was a, a good movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there the, was, fifth, the Fifth Power. 
the, the powers of good. There's a lot of good, and and I think especially if you if you have a Judeo Christian background, whether or not you believe, mm-hmm. you're trained to be afraid of these things. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's sort I mean, of rooted mostly in. mostly horror movies. Mostly comes up in the horror yeah, movies. yeah, or thriller kind of horror yeah. movies or whatever. But um, all worth seeing, I think. Watch the Paul. Not really. <laughs> no, but, I mean, you need to watch them all. <laughs> yeah, probably probably not. Actually. Yeah, just wait for good recommendations. There's uh, a lot of bad. All before movies out there. All before you watch Waterworld, but definitely. <laughs> yeah, you could skip Independence Day too. Don't bother. <laughs> yeah, you can. It's, your life will definitely not be hurt, but you will learn the power of the MacBook. All right, so I think we're getting to one of the biggest ones right here. For today, I think most of the movies now are disease. Yeah, it's They're, all about disease. Yeah, and why? Why would disease ones? What possibly could be uh, so interesting about what swine flu, bird flu, SARS? Yeah. Um, there was oh, what was the big one here in the United States just recently? Um, uh, it came back from from Africa. Uh, thing in the oh, the Ebola, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ebola. Ebola. Yeah, yeah Ebola. I think that's a candy. <laughs> <laughs> Ebola. I have an Ebola candy. Mmm, delicious. Um, and there's actually uh, contagion. We didn't actually talk about in the pre-show, but that's a great example. That's actually a good that's one. That's a but good movie. That's more of the breakout, not the end. Um, okay. Or am I mixing it up with a different one? Because there were a couple right well, around that time. Well, no. Contagion's newer. Contagion was um, uh, Matt um, uh, Matt Damon. Okay, you might be you, you might be thinking of uh, the one with Dust, outbreak. Dust, outbreak with Dustin. That's Hoffman. what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Contagion yeah. is newer, and it's basically a a new super disease comes out and just surprises us. Like it just it develops. On its own. It's not something they built in a lab, but it develops on its own and it takes humanity by surprise and it wipes out tons of people. And the problem is that we're scrounging to find a cure to salvage whatever is left. And it's airborne. It's like, it's absolutely terrifying. Like what, what can occur? And, and, and and that movie is very much based in reality. Like Mm. what they show you totally believe could happen. Mm. Um, but I think most of our, our our disease examples are more they they fall a little in the more supernatural, but they, but they're still diseases and they're fun. They're diseases with the way they're done here. They could be supernatural if done like if done in other ways. Those could be supernatural. But it's a, it's actually kind of funny that both of those movies probably should have been in supernatural. No, no, because you of think what, the, and here's where I draw the line with why I think they're disease movies. It's because of it's. N- the the zombies which these both have mm-hmm. are caused by a disease right there's not a supernatural root to it my my argument to that is once a thing is dead it's dead and that makes it supernatural even if they want to explain it with science you weren't paying attention to walking dead they're not dead the walking dead they are dead no, no, no. yes they are mm-hmm. Um, okay, so uh, there's part of their brain that c- continues to function. No, the brain dies and it restarts. You remember the episode in the, in the CDC at the end of season? That's one? what I'm remembering. I thought no, I, I thought I did. No, she dies, and then there's a brief period of time where there's zero activity and it reignites something, and that's where I say it leaves science and it gets to fantasy. It gets to supernatural because just because I don't believe that can happen. That's all. I. You're, I, I'm fine with you, you found water world believable but zombies <laughs> zombies are not real I'm fine with suspending the disbelief because it's such a great show but I think that calling I, I think that I think that putting it in the same category as a movie like Outbreak or Contagion is unfair to those movies because they're very very much based within the bounds of reality where I don't think the these definitely are not exactly no, that's, I, that's I do call them a disease and because it's a disease that's doing it and you obviously need a suspension of disbelief when you get to the whole but I would argue whenever there are zombies involved you you need a, yeah. a bit of a suspension of disbelief yeah because the other big thing that I that I would argue in that because you're saying oh no they're alive and I'm like well what about in I, I forget it was in late in season two where one of the characters, I won't say the name so nothing gets spoiled, starts shooting a zombie through all of the, and he's poignantly so because mm-hmm. he's stating what's occurring while he's because doing it. Because the body's all the, operating into, differently no, now. No, 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 no. But he's shooting through. He's like, okay, that's the lungs, that's the heart, that's the liver. Mm-hmm. Any one of these shots would kill a living person and mm-hmm. they're not alive. 
I think it's all semantics. I think they're alive. And I think that your definition, are, I think your definition of alive needs to be wild. examined. I think that we're both. We didn't we, define we, that. We didn't define that That's at the right. top of the show. We defined apocalypse, but not alive. <laughs> so, all right. So the other one, obviously we're talking about the walking dead mm-hmm. and the other one that's up on the board is I am legend, which surprisingly really enjoyed that movie. I, I that yeah. is a fun movie. Yeah. I, I really chalk up that movie to be like, the castaway yeah. set in a zombie apocalypse. Yes. And they did a good job with that where you know, like walking in the video store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which does kind of date the movie there. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. It's <laughs> a little bit. You know. But you but you know, I mean there was some very amusing stuff along those lines with that. And once you got, you know, for me, after an hour they didn't really need to keep doing the movie. Um and there was a story, but the story didn't really suck me in that much, but yeah, I, it's the character. It's the character and 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 the immersion in the world part, which I found interesting in it. So our cause for apocalypse and and all of these is a is a disease is a is a a mankind ending disease. Oh. Um, and uh, we were looking at lists before we started the show, and I, I like to mention it just because it is such an engrossing watch. Um, Twenty eight days later. But my argument to that is there's no apocalypse in that movie because it's a self-contained um, – it's like a – it's a small apocalypse. It only it only happens in the United Kingdom because it's a, yeah. it's an island it's, – it's waterlocked. Like it doesn't make it back to the main body of Europe. So it's not an apocalypse because the rest of the planet is doing just fine. In the movie. Yes. But they then walk through the water. They go through the channel. My point is that – for the purposes of calling it an apocalyptic story or even a post-apocalyptic story, it's not accurate. Well, it's definitely not post-apocalyptic, but it's the apocalypse is starting. It's starting in Britain. They just don't, okay. they don't play so, it off. All right, so we're going to chalk it into the pre-apocalyptic? Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> the apocalypse is starting. It just hasn't finished. Okay. It's about the apocalypse happening during the part of time it's in Britain. Okay. It is terrifying. It's a great movie. Yeah, twenty eight days later is scary. Yeah, and I, I I did like it because they they play around with the stereotypes of zombies, which yeah, most shows don't do. They do the classic thing, and and I don't want to get into it, but they do play with the stereotype, and I enjoy that kind of fiction. Yeah, and and that and that first movie, the twenty eight days later, came out at a time where we weren't where they weren't showing us zombies that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have to look at the release dates of whether. The new version of Dawn of the Dead or 28 Days Later came out first. I'm mm. not sure which one came out first. Yeah. I think 28 Days Later came out first. Um, but Dawn of the Dead is also a great example of that, an that, apocalyptic that, not movie. disease. Okay, so the Walking Dead zombies are a disease, but the Dawn of the Dead zombies are not. Actually, I don't remember how they start being the zombie thing started in that one. So they, it are, might be. I, they don't, I don't think they ever actually explain. And, and actually the only reason I'll buy it for those is because the story was there's a disease outbreak that could not be contained, which caused the zombies. Well, I think for the purposes of the show, the, the most important thing to point out is that it is a post apocalyptic story. It is a worldwide yeah. apocalypse mm-hmm. where, where almost all of humanity is. It's done. like apocalypse now. Yeah. 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 Wait, that's a movie. <laughs> it's an apocalypse happening now, so we'll call it Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse Now, and there's no apocalypse in the Apocalypse Now movie, so it's kind of misleading. Mm-hmm. We'll yeah. call it Apocalypse Now, but there's no apocalypse. They might feel that way to some people, though. Um, what is our time at? We are way over. We're way over an hour, but, but that we're, is we're, okay. We're gonna, we're gonna soldier. We're, we're, as far as we are, we might as well soldier through the last. You know, we, we should because we're. I mean, we're essentially we're through the main portion of the show, so. Why don't well, we, I want to cover psychological. Oh, you're right. We that, that's what I'm saying. We did. I, I want to do did that. It. Okay, so how are you going to destroy your world? We've covered ecological disasters. We've covered a deep impact style, war, alien invasion, technology, supernatural disease. And there's, that's it. And that's it. That's it. And that's all. There are, those are all the types of apocalypse you can have. Yeah. No. I mean, you'd be crazy to have You'd be one. crazy to have one, which is why psychological apocalypse is so interesting. Yeah. So there is a movie called The Last Days. Now, this is going to be a deep cut for you. Probably going to have a hard time finding this one. It was on Netflix. It might still be. Um, I believe it's in Spanish. And uh, absolutely great movie where the story is that all of humanity gets... Uh, 
a disease that is not on the surface, so it's not bothering you. It's not like you're sick or what have you, but everyone gets uh, severe agoraphobia. So, so much to the, to the degree that if they literally leave a building and get only a few feet outside of the building, they seize up in such a panic they have a heart attack and die. Mm. So now you have everyone on the planet stuck indoors. Yeah. We can't go out and farm. Mm. We can't go out and gather, hunt and gather. Mm. We're stuck inside or subterranean. Mm. And it's such an interesting idea that I'd never seen any movie like that. And that movie delivers it beautifully. Great characters um, and not just character driven. There's a decent story there too. So I highly recommend you you go check out the movie Which, last, the last I, I hope I can find that because until you said psychological, I think I stopped when you said psychological because it's something that had never occurred to me. And it's something that would be interesting to watch no matter what causes the, it's it, Real, it's a really cool concept. I mean, you could chalk it up to disease because it is like they maybe have, a disease caused yeah, it disease or whatever. Caused it or or but what, really, or you could all say, oh well, it's a mental disease. Well, that's yeah, well, that's why yeah. we're calling it psychological. psychological. To yeah. Identify what we mean. Yeah, yeah. psychological apocalypse. Because I never really thought of that one before. Yeah, neither did I. And actually, I think you came up with a couple up there. I don't think I would have called the ecological um, disaster. I don't think I would have called it that. So I like that you used that wording. Yeah, because yeah, that's really what it is. Yeah, that, it's it the is. ecology of the world. I think I would have called it environmental. I think I would have gone with it. But I, like the, I like the other word. That's better. too today. That's too, you know, that word will be of no consequence in 10 years. Environmental? Yeah. I think that word It's been overplayed. Overplayed. <laughs> okay. So what is the, um, what's the uh, world builder's task of the day? The world builder's task of the day is to think of a way to destroy your world. The world you've spent years, decades working on. Well, I love in that world. Think of how, if you were to destroy it. If you had to destroy it. If you wanted to, which I have. If you're going to. And you should go to and kaboom it. Or however you want to kaboom it. How would you destroy your world? And, you know... you know, make decisions what what's going to survive, what's not going to survive. Because obviously, to get to the post apocalyptic story part, is what happens after the actual apocalypse. And and also maybe not how you want to destroy it, but based on what you've created, what is the most logical ending? Like if 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 the world is going to create its own apocalypse, because you know how sometimes I was going to say create a dartboard, but I guess logic. Well, you, too. well, no, no, no. I, you don't. I'm, I'm all for not using logic. It's like mm-hmm. this. Obviously, if you're creating a world, it's all about you know. Or you imagine, can always put the logic in there yeah, to do exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe that's how you 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 make it more interesting is by creating mm-hmm. a logic that's not there, that's not sound. Mm-hmm. But if you get if you create enough reason, I'll buy it. Yeah. But. Maybe if you have no intention on destroying yeah. your world, look at what you've created and see if the world has an apocalypse recipe, yeah. so to speak, already built in there. And we're not saying you have to destroy your world, but how would it go? That's right. And what would happen after it went? And maybe that's just maybe that would just be a great story experiment for you. Mm-hmm. Maybe you write a story about well, like call even, a writer's prompt. Yeah. I mean, just just think of it as an exercise because one. It'll force you to take all of the cultures you've you've developed and rethink if they're still there, how do they not behave when the environment is now different? Um real world task of the day? Plan to destroy the world. Well, we just covered. No, 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 no. The world. Our world. Just come up with a good plan. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You you want to tell everyone to come up with a plan to destroy our world. Yeah. I mean it's a good exercise because then how would the world be destroyed? You, this might be a little irresponsible because you realize you're trying to influence some of the most creative people on the planet who also tend to be the most resourceful <laughs> on, on you're, you're giving them a task of ending world, the world and mankind and along the way. Well, I mean, they don't, I'm not saying do it. I'm just saying, you know, plot it out. <laughs> I don't think that they should plot it out, Jeff. I don't think that's, no, that's a good I don't idea. think it's responsible. <laughs> Well, can you come up with something better than destroying the world? It's a real world task. For I the could, day? Maybe not something as grand as destroying the world, <laughs> but something a little more responsible. Um, for those of you living in our hemisphere, it's summertime. And I would say, why don't you go out and try to enjoy the summer? We, you know, summertime rolls around. It's so hot out. I know Jeff's rolling his eyes now because all he wants is death and destruction. Mm. Um, 
summertime rolls around and I think we all have an idea, maybe a Norman Rockwell idea of what summertime is. Barbecues and the beach and camping and all that jazz. Destroyed world. Destroy the, sure, if that's on your summertime plan. But I don't think we all go to the effort to do all those things. So what I'm saying is put the extra effort in and get the family or if it's just you, just you and do a more extravagant Maybe a day trip or a summertime day plan, like have a barbecue, invite a bunch of people over, maybe blow off some fireworks safely and responsibly. Uh, if it's legal, if it's legal. legal where you are, thank you. <laughs> um, go to the beach, go camping, go do something to enjoy the summer mm. without plotting the end of all of civilization and, and all the species on the planet. Let's skip that. I'm sorry, I was thinking about something. What were you saying? I'm saying skip destroying the planet. <sighs> I'm saying some, I'm, I'm really pushing to skipping that. Okay. I have to go outside? Well, unless you can come up with a good indoor plan, I would, I would accept that. I could do that editing and write a story? But that's not really a summertime plan. Like I'm saying like an idealized summertime plan. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe a bike ride? Could you do a bike ride? Write a story about the broken end of the bike ride. I'm still stretching that. <laughs> still stretching it a little. <laughs> Um, I'm sure it, it comes of no surprise that, um, since this episode is well over an hour, we could just go on and on and on about, and we will. So this is not the only apocalypse episode there. There are, this is part one. No, yeah, no, there are definitely multiple episodes here. We really want to kind of cover the causes and really, and we might even go back to some of these things that we really like and, and do one of my Iraq explorers sort of exploration of that world. And some of the worlds that are more explicit but focused on that. However, really, we wanted to cover the cause and, and, and show some of the ideas that are out there that you can pull from. The next episode, we want to talk about, and this is the cheese, once the apocalypse has happened, what has society turned to? What does the world look like? And if it's a complete apocalypse, it'll be very quick. <laughs> but we'll probably talk about more the post-apocalyptic worlds where... It was a cl really close call. Right. Like there's like less than 10% of humanity left. Exactly. So we'll look at some of the more interesting societies that we've bumped into in these kind of story formats. And we'll talk about, one, just how do you survive in a much harsher environment? And then the rudiments of society will start peeking their ugly head, especially if humanity is not wiped out. And what might those look like in, in some of the more interesting ways that we've seen? And as always, make sure to go to Garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com for the show notes. It'll be under Podcasting, World Builders Anvil. That's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you've just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us in this episode of the World Builders Anvil. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes. And please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike while the myth rolls high. <laughs>